You know, it's just now that I'm realizing figuring out what to say at the start of a video is kind of awkward. Like, what do I say? Like, hello, starfarers? Star, star sectorers? No, no, no. None of that's any good. I think I'm going to go with the option that's funniest to me. And that's really simple. Hello, gamers! Welcome! We're going to be doing a little bit of a instructional video on how to do fleet combat not bad. Or ideally to do it good, but not bad would be a start. Now, depending on how difficult you find this to be, you can bring the battle size down to 200, and that'll make things a bit easier. I'll get into why later. I'm going to be doing it on 400 because I am an absolute animal, and I like pain and suffering. That's a terrible joke. I'm going to cut that out when I'm... I'm kidding. I'm not going to edit this video. I'm too lazy for that. So, what we're going to be doing is the mission The Last Hurrah. The reason we're going to be doing this is because it's kind of an extension of the tutorial. Right? You've got your tutorials for basic, advanced, and fleet command. Those give you the tools. Those tell you how the game works, but it doesn't actually tell you how to use them. Like, in practical terms, what that's going to look like. It gives you the specifics. It does not give you the broader scope of what a battle is going to look like. This mission, I think is very good for that. It does give you a full-on fleet-on-fleet -fleet combat. Right? You've got, you, the fleets are even thematic. You've got a midline fleet versus a low-tech fleet, so the way that they play is actually pretty different. It's definitely my favorite mission. It's actually quite a bit of fun. But it is difficult because of the difference in deployment points. Now, I have changed some of the ships to match what they're going to be in the next patch, right? Like, the Vigilance is getting a little bit more, more flux capacity. The Eagle is getting a little bit more dissipation and top speed. So, technically, this is a little easier than whatever you're going to be playing in the current patch. But when the next patch comes out, this will be accurate. Well, about as accurate as I can make it. So, with that in mind... This fleet that we're piloting is a total of 171 deployment points. The enemy fleet is 236. So they are significantly bigger than you, and you have no officers, no player skills, no S mods, nothing to really bring that, nothing to squeeze out extra power from your ships to compensate for that difference, aside from your knowledge of loadouts and how to build ships and your command, ability to command and all of that. Now, I did show a screenshot in the community tab of me beating this mission with no losses on my side and every single enemy ship destroyed or disabled. No, they didn't, not a single one of them got away. I will be honest, that was pretty lucky. I cannot do that consistently because this is a pretty difficult mission. Now, if I get lucky again and I get through this with a perfect score, that would be awesome because it'd make me look really good, but don't expect me to do that because I have no idea if I'm going to do that. It's, there's a lot of things that are outside of your control. For example, you might notice that the enemy fleet has a lot of carriers. If, they decide, if three Moras all decide to send their fighters after, say, the Sunder, you can say goodbye to the Sunder. There's not really a lot you can do about that. I, I've tried different builds with it. It really is not designed to survive like two broadsword wings and a warthog wing, and then like a kopesh wing spraying it with annihilators. It, it's just not designed to survive that, so you kind of have to hope that the AI just doesn't target it with a bunch of fighter wings at once. But even if that does happen, you should be able to beat the mission. You just won't get out with no losses. So with that, first off, we're going to talk about the builds, because, well, you can reset it to the defaults, but that's going to make things more difficult. Oh yeah, this thing also is getting 10 more Hornets points in the next patch, so the default build is not fully utilizing all those points. Anyways, importantly, well, there's a lot of important things. Setting it to the default is going to be more difficult. Now, I don't want to take away the fun of coming up with builds, because as far as I'm concerned, that's where a lot of the fun in this game comes from. But if you're not really sure what to do, you can copy these, and that's... You know, that's not a bad thing to do, right? If you just want to practice the, the fleet command component and you're not really interested in practicing the loadout building component, then copying this should give you a fairly good place to work from. So we're going to start with the Vigilance. 
definitely not on my short list of frigates I would want. It's got a lot of problems. It's sure, it's getting buffed. It's getting 500 more flux capacity and I think 250 extra hull. I still think it could come down to like four deployment points, but we're not going to worry about that for now. We've got what we've got. So, how do we make this thing work? First of all, as I've already pointed out, the enemy fleet has a lot of carriers. This means that we're up against a lot of fighters, and if you're a frigate, fighters are a big issue. Because the great thing about frigates is that they're fast and they're small. They mostly survive by avoiding direct confrontation with bigger ships, right? Like, if this thing goes up against a dominator, it would die. But it doesn't have to go up against a dominator. It can circle around it. Like, two omens can easily kill a dominator by themselves. They'll take a while, sure. But they can easily circle around it and start EMPing the engines. It's really, really simple to do. So, with that in mind, the only things that are really threatening to your fighter, to your frigates, are fighters and other frigates. So we're going to need a weapon loadout that's able to deal with enemy fighters and enemy frigates, because those are the main things we're concerned about. Right? Now, you can build frigates to attack larger ships, but looking at this fleet, we need something to go and take capture points. We need something to act as a bit of a, you know, a point runner. And for that purpose, these are the best we've got. These are our, these are the frigates they gave us, so this is what we've got to work with. It's going to be fighting other frigates, and it's got to survive enemy fighter swarms. And for that purpose, I think the Thumper is actually the best choice. Normally I don't use the Thumper, but it is pretty good at shooting against fighters. And the enemy frigates, as you can see here, are these Lashers, and I believe the loadout is pretty mediocre. They've got three Vulcans, two dual autocannons, which... Dual autocannons seem pretty good on paper, but something that a lot of people miss, or at least I missed when I first looked at them, is that they have very, they have much worse accuracy than the single autocannon. Right, so the single shot light autocannon is actually a lot better, in my experience, than the dual. Right? It's not just that it has 100 more range, it's also, see that accuracy, it says medium, this says very poor. If you're not hitting your target, your gun's not doing much. The light dual autocannons have some of the worst accuracy in the game. So, generally I don't use them. Now, where was I? I was at Thumpers. Okay. Thumpers. The enemy lashers are pretty mediocre. So, even though Thumpers are not the best weapon, having one on these is good enough to deal with the, th with the lashers. At least, it's good enough to drive up their flux and then convince the lasher to back off. And it's pretty good at shooting at fighters. So, it's an unusual pick as far as I'm concerned, but I think in this situation the Thumper works. For the missile, I really like pylums, actually. I love the way that they changed them to do fragmentation and EMP instead of high explosive damage. And that second stage, I think these are actually really useful now, whereas before they were they were kind of a meme. You either go all pylums and just flood the battlefield with an infinite number of missiles, or you don't use pylums at all because they're useless by themselves. They were only useful if you could flood the battlefield. Now they're actually good as a support weapon, which I think is fantastic. So, it can shoot at fighters, it can support larger ships by launching pylums at enemy cruisers, and it's good enough for shooting at enemy frigates. Awesome. Okay, next step. How do we keep it alive? Well, it's a frigate, so we're going to max out shields. There's not really any way around this. If it's a frigate, you're probably maxing out shields. You know, there's some exceptions, right? You, you, you're not doing that with a vanguard, for example. You, you couldn't even if you wanted to. But for the most part, it's shields. Right? Heavy armor is not good on frigates. 150 armor, that's going to take you to 350. You could survive a bit longer against fighters. That's about it. Right? You're not armor tanking with this thing. Even if you take a lasher, you get up to, what, 450 armor. If you throw an armored weapon mouse, you can get up to 480. Ooh, that's almost as much as a hammerhead. But even then, a hammerhead's not armor tanking anything. So, compare that to how much value you get out of shields, right? Look at this. 
We've almost doubled our flux capacity just by getting 10 capacitors. Then you throw in hardened shields. This is easily more than twice the baseline shield capacity. That's quite a bit of damage compared to 150 armor. So pretty much frigates, you're always going for shields. I don't know if I talked about that in the last video, but uh, it's something important to drive home. Now the next thing is the vigilance is a little slow as far as frigates go, right? You know, high high tech frigates are one thing, right? Ignore those. Those they have insane speeds, like 150, 155, 180. They're pretty crazy. For low tech and midline, the standard speed of a frigate is 120. The vigilance is a little bit slow. So for that reason, I would recommend unstable injectors. Actually. Even if it was 120, I would probably still get unstable injectors because you're getting 25 top speed and you're losing 15% range. 15% on a weapon with 700 is not a lot, right? You're going down to, you're going down by 105 range, I believe. The thing is, on a capital ship, that's a big deal, but on a frigate, it's not. And the reason is, well, if you have 135 top speed, it takes you less than a second to cover that extra distance. If you're in a capital ship with a, a top speed of 25, that extra distance is going to take you several seconds to cover. Here, it's basically nothing. So we're not worried about it. And then lastly, get enough vents. You know, this plus this, it's 20, 222, got a little bit extra, which is fine because fast missile racks also costs flux. Yeah, that's, that's really all this is going to do. And don't forget, you can shift-click to add another of the same weapon. Make things faster. All of these are basically just going to do this. Now, another thing I could consider is instead of ECCM, I could consider hardened subsystems. Because one thing the Vigilants do have going for them is 240p performance is not bad. Right, high tech frigates are all at 180. They they basically need hardened subsystems. 240 is not bad, and this battle can go on for a bit long. So it's definitely worth considering. But I'm just going to give them ECCM. By the time the battle runs on that long, I'm I imagine I will just retreat these, and then I won't worry about them. They won't be necessary by that point. But early on, they're definitely important. Okay, Gemini. I have a really hard time keeping this thing alive. It doesn't seem to matter what you put on it, it tries to charge the enemy and get into shooting range. You could put flak cannons on it, it'll get right in their face to shoot flak at them. Now, there's a couple problems with this. First of all, you're slow. You are, you are cruiser speed, even though you're a destroyer. And even as far as destroyers go, you're pretty fragile. 250 armor and a base flux capacity of 2,700. This is frigate level du durability right here. Yeah, it's got a bit more hull, but it, that's not gonna save you, my friend. So, what do we do with this? Well, the best thing I figured out how to do with this is to tell it to sit in the corner and not get anywhere near the enemy. Now, it can still contribute to the battle thanks to nav relay and ECM package. And actually, on top of that, Thunders, with 6,000 engagement range, it can sit pretty far out in the corner and still reach some enemies. Now, Pylums only have 4,000 range, so there's going to be a lot of the time where it's just it's so far away that it can't even shoot this. But it's at least worth putting there. Flat cannons in case enemy fighters come to attack it. Lastly, ECM package... Expanded deck crew. Expanded deck crew is not all that good, but might as well. Not really doing anything else with this setup. And yeah, this thing is just going to sit in the corner and not get near the enemy because I, I'm going to try and keep everything alive. It may not be possible. We will see. I'm going to do the same beam loadout as before. Well, not exactly the same. The beams are going to be the same, because that's definitely my favorite thing to do with the Sunder. It's very good as a support ship, right? These Graviton beams, while normally are pretty bad, they are good when you stack two of them with high energy focus and you're shooting at a frigate. Because each of these adds 
200 soft flux to the enemy system. This is adding 250. So put together, that's 650 soft flux. That's already overwhelming the frigate's dissipation. Then you throw in high energy focus. Well, now it's 975. That's going to fill up the frigate's flux bar pretty quickly. And then the high intensity laser will delete its armor and hull pretty quickly. So this setup is pretty good as an anti-frigate barrage, although it's not really a barrage, it's a, it's beams. So there's not, I don't know if I have a word to describe that, but it's pretty cool. Now this time, instead of doing sabos, I'm going to do light needlers, just to show that they are pretty good. Yeah, the flux dissipation is a bit high, but most of the time it's not going to be shooting these. And you can see here, well, I do need save, stabilized shields. You basically want this every time. Six points to reduce the shield upkeep by 100 is a pretty good deal. So look, it's only generating like 50 flux a second by itself. Now if an enemy gets close, shooting these at it is going to generate a bunch of flux, but it's going to generate a lot more flux for them than it is for you. And the Sunder has a pretty significant flux capacity as far as destroyers go. Right? That's, the, that's kind of the design idea here. If you're wondering why the shield efficiency is the way it is, it's because the devs wanted to give it enough flux capacity to do something like an auto pulse laser without filling up its flux bar entirely, but giving it a lot of flux capacity would give it, make its shield too strong, and they don't want its shield to be too strong. So what they do is they give it a big flux capacity and a bad shield efficiency. This is the same idea behind the conquest. 20,000 flux capacity is a lot, even for a capital ship but they didn't want its shields to actually be strong. They just wanted that flux capacity so you could fire all the weapons on both sides without fluxing your, without maxing out your flux in two seconds. So they give it a big flux and they give it a bad shield. And of course, there's also the reverse. The Pegasus that's coming out in the next patch is the reverse, where it's going to have a low flux capacity because he wants it to be bad at shooting guns, he mostly wants to rely on the missiles, but if you make its flux capacity low, then it's not durable enough to be a battleship. So you compensate for that by giving it really good shield efficiency. That's the whole idea there. Now we're going to put a Vulcan on the back. I'm going to ignore the missile slots this time. And yeah, this should be fine. That's a fairly, it's a fairly solid build. This guy. Hypervelocity drivers, targeting unit. This gives it the ability to shoot at cruisers because the problem that destroyers have is that where I said that frigates rely on their small size and their speed to survive and cruisers can just confront the enemy head on, destroyers are in kind of an awkward spot. They're a lot bigger of a target, they're a lot slower than frigates, but they don't really have the power to compete with larger ships. And if they get into a battle with say a cruiser, well, they're, they're not really fast enough to pull out once they realize they're in trouble. So, the re so the, what I usually do with destroyers to make them actually function in a fleet is to rely on long range, right? This is why the Sunder works pretty well. You can get 1400 range with these beams, and that, uh, that high intensity laser is going to be pretty useful against a low-tech fleet. This guy it's got 1200 range, that's not bad. You know, if you get gunnery implants and ballistic mastery, now you're looking at 1450. That's pretty comparable to capital ships. So it's still gonna get in the enemy's range, but it's sitting at the edge of their range. It's not getting halfway to the enemy ship, then realizing, oh, I can't be, I can't 1v1 this, and then trying to run away and just dying. This is where the Medusa has traditionally struggled. Now. With the changes coming up to the next patch, the Medusa might be useful, I'll, I'll see, but generally I've ignored the Medusa, because a, a while ago it was overpowered, they nerfed it, and now it doesn't really have the... It doesn't really have anything going for it. Like, if you want a high-tech destroyer, the Shrike is a much better choice, because the Shrike doesn't have range, that's true, but it's got eight deployment points for a very strong shield and 100 baseline top speed. If you throw on unstable injectors, you get you, know, you maximize your fleet's nav rating. You know you get helmsmanship on that thing. Well, at that point, it's faster than most frigates, 
and it's got a, a shield that's twice as strong as most frigates. So what you end up, so you can actually make the Shrike work because for eight deployment points, you're basically getting a big frigate. The problem with the Medusa is, yeah, you you can do the same thing, but it's not priced like a big frigate. It's priced at twelve deployment points. Is it fifty percent stronger than a Shrike? Not really. So I usually leave the Medusa by the wayside. Hammerheads, Sunders, and Manticores. They aren't just big frigates, right? They can't do that same playstyle, but what they do have going for them is range. The Enforcer might be able to do the same thing, but I've not had much success with it yet. I won't, I won't, I'm not yet ready to rule it out, but so far it doesn't seem promising. Now, this. What we have here is, these are our main guns. These light auto cannons. Now, later on, I would love to upgrade these to rail guns, but given that I don't have flux regulation or ordnance expertise or anything, light auto cannons will have to do the, the budget option. What we have is our main guns for shooting at long range for against, say, cruisers. But if enemies get closer, having backup weapons to do more damage to raise that DPS is actually pretty useful. At first, I thought the mismatch between ranges would be too much of an issue, but as it turns out, I found that this actually works pretty well. Now, with all these kinetics, you need something to deal with armor. Breach missiles are great for that. They, they have, a, for just three points, you're getting a lot of ammo and a lot of anti-armor damage. They have good tracking, good HP, they're kind of great. What they can't do is what, well, Reapers can do. They can't overload the enemy shields, they, they don't do a lot of hull damage. They strictly strip off armor. But for this ship, that's going to be okay. Actually, I'm going to link them together. Because these things have decent enough hit strength that once the armor is stripped off, the residual damage reduction that the ship has... See, that's the problem with a lot of, like, say, thumpers. Uh, if you've got a big, heavily armored ship, even after you strip off the armor, there's going to be enough residual armor that the thumper's hit strength is so low that it loses most of its DPS. That's why it's only really good against lighter targets. With these things, they actually have pretty solid hit strength. So they're not going to punch through heavy armor, but once the armor is stripped off by the breach missiles, they should do decent hull damage. Uh, I'm also going to throw in some burst PDs. These will shoot down salamanders and they'll help against fighters. And then just max out flux stats. Uh, now, the flux is a bit scary because it's higher than the the... The weapon flux is higher than the dissipation here, so it's tempting to go for a flux distributor. But what I found is you're actually better off getting capacitors in this case. Because for starters, right, we, we can strip these off. This is what's going to be shooting most of the time, and this is exactly 450. But once the enemy gets closer and you start shooting more of your weapons, you don't really need that extra dissipation. Having... right. Okay, and now I'm getting a little... This is a little long-winded. I hope it's not too long. So having that extra dissipation to just absorb the extra soft flux for the duration of the close-range battle is fine. All right, that'll do just fine on this ship. Yeah, I think we should move on before it gets too long because I, I could talk for a very long time about each of these. And I'm going to do just that with the herons. So first of all... They have several frigates, four lashers and one hound. For that, thunders are a great choice. They're fast, they have long reach, they have a combination of kinetic, high explosive, and EMP. They're just good at what they do. Now I'm going to combine that with a pylum. And what I'm going to do here is put a nav relay, because this thing doesn't actually need a ton of stuff, because this is not going to be a combat ship. Uh, the Heron is not really designed to be a combat ship. Now, you can do some interesting builds, but I don't think they're necessarily the best. And that means you've got a lot of leftover ordnance points. So what do you put them into? Well, a nav relay is a good choice. All right, with the nav relay here, this is 3%. Putting each of these together with more nav relays is going to get us 11%. The maximum is 20, so 11% speed 
fleet-wide is going to be very useful, especially considering that's how we're going to beat this mission. I forgot to mention this. It's, it does tell you what the point of this mission is. Right? Defeat all enemy forces, use superior mobility to choose your battles, engaging the flagship in a fair fight you will lose. Right? This is like an extension of the tutorial. Instead of teaching you specific game mechanics, it's loosening the reins a bit and saying, okay, learn how to use the tools we've given you on a, in a more like broader scale, like how do I actually apply them, more generalized concepts. So doubling down on that mobility is going to be important because that's the, like, that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to rely on our mobility to win a fight that we should not win. So nav relay, that's a good choice here. Then ECACM package to boost the pylum. And the rest can just go into capacitors. Doesn't need to have the insane shields because herons are pretty good. They're generally going to try and stay out of the enemy's way. It just needs enough that if an enemy gets close, it can block a few shots and then get out of range. Now, this one. This one we're going to do differently. Cobras. Cobras are very interesting. I think flash bombers, strictly speaking, are more effective before you factor in replacement rate, because flash bombers are going to chew through your replacement rate and you're going to be sitting at 30%. Cobras don't have that issue. In fact, I think as far as fighters go, they are the best in terms of replacement rate. Because if a Cobra ring gets wiped out, that is 20 seconds to replace. For other fighters, say daggers, if that wing gets wiped out, that's 56 seconds to replace. And the longer it takes to replace, the more of your replacement rate it depletes. So it kind of has an exponential negative effect on the ship's ability to launch fighters. Interestingly, a trident wing actually only takes 50 seconds compared to the 56 of a dagger. So not only do you get four, four torpedoes per wing, like think about that. It's taking you less time to replace them and they're bringing more torpedoes when they come back. Now, obviously that's why they're a lot more expensive and also slower. If you wanted to do a balanced build on the Heron, you'd probably do something like Dagger, let's see, I passed it, Longbow, and a Broadsword. All right, you've got Flares and Kinetic Damage, more Kinetic Damage, and then some High Explosive. This can work, right, because this is, this is good enough to blow up the shields of a frigate and then get some torpedoes in. Or against larger ships, it can also be useful, even if it's not blasting it to pieces. But I don't generally recommend balanced loadouts on your carriers because there's a big difference between fighters and regular ships. Regular ships, you need, a sh you need more of a balanced loadout. Right? You cannot say, you, know, it's, you can't make a hyper-specialized ship. It's, it's kind of hard to do that, but let's say that you did. Let's say that you made a destroyer that 100% kills frigates, no problem, but if it goes up against a cruiser, it instantly evaporates. That's a terrible design. Because there's a lot going on in the game that you cannot control. You cannot put the ship exactly where it needs to be. If it's specialized to kill frigates, but dies to cruisers, well, sometimes it's going to find itself in front of a cruiser. You cannot then say, oh, no, okay, you need to be over there, right? And then give it a command to run over there. You can try doing that. It's not very reliable. So instead, you need to have something that's a bit more generalized. It can certainly be better at killing certain things than other things, but you can't have a hyper-specialized build. With fighters, it's a totally different story, because not only are they faster than everything else, they just fly through ships. They can go wherever you need them to be. So with that being the case, they don't run into that issue of, I needed you to be killing that frigate, but you're over on the wrong side of the map. It's like, yeah, the, the, the Thunders might be on the wrong side of the map, but you can just click on the Heron, right-click on the frigate, and the Thunders will go flying way over there, to where they're supposed to be. So specialized fighter wings work much better than specialized ships. And this is why we're going with Cobras. Because they are not going to hit frigates ever, but three Reapers that are doing 6,000 damage each thanks to targeting feed, you only need one to hit a Dominator and all of that armor is gone. 
Right? A couple of bombing runs can easily kill one. Now, it does need to get through point defense, uh, but that's not... Like, in a 1v1, let's say, against uh, an onslaught, this is not going to do anything, obviously. But if you've got other ships driving up the onslaught's flux or hitting it with ion beams, disabling its point defense, or you can even get the Heron around behind the onslaught because it's fast enough and the onslaught might be distracted by, say, an eagle, and then you're shoving reapers up its tailpipe. In that case, it's gonna, you're going to be thanking your lucky stars you brought some Cobras. Right? They, they bring great firepower for a relatively cheap cost as far as bombers go, decent top speed, great with their, in terms of their replacement rate, the only real weakness is that they have no guidance package, so they're not going to hit anything small. Although, here's a little secret. I've noticed something, which is that bombers are draining your replacement rate while they're still on their way back to the carrier. Okay. But, no wait, so that's, okay, so hold on, I need to explain that. This is why daggers are a lot better on herons than tridents is because herons are fast. So if it's running away from the enemy and sending daggers to shoot at it, the daggers are going 95 units of speed faster than the heron. And that's how quickly they're going to catch up. These things are only going 50 units of speed faster. So it's going to take them actually twice. So even though it's only about 50% faster than the tridents, it's going to take them about twice as long to catch up. This is not really an issue that other carriers have. It's mostly unique to the heron. But interestingly, if the wing is depleted and it's still on its way back to the carrier, if it's taking too long, it seems like the carrier is allowed to deploy one bomber from each wing before they even get back. It's kind of weird. Now, for most bombers, that's just a nice little thing to take the edge off. For the Cobra, it can be a little silly. I have seen cases where you've got three Cobras all on their way back to the carrier. They have not caught up yet and it deploys a fresh three, sends them out on a bombing run, and then you've now got six Cobras with no missiles chasing the Heron to get back to it, and then it deployed another three and sent them on a bombing run, and so now you've got nine Cobras all on the field from this one Heron. And, be and even though there's six chasing it, the fact that it deployed three means that its wings are all replenished, so it's not losing the replacement rate even though they haven't caught up yet. I might want to record that one day because it's kind of hilarious to watch but yeah cobras are a kind of a unique bomber they're very specialized but they're very good at what they do now i'm gonna go with i can't really afford the eccm because i'm paying 15 extra for the fighters and instead of pylum i'm gonna go with salamander because hopefully let's say there's an enforcer enforcers are uh, Cobras are going to have a hard time hitting an Enforcer, but if the Salamanders take out its engine, then it'll be easier to hit. Uh, the chances of that happening are not high, but it's it's worth considering. There's a, a small amount of synergy between Salamanders and Cobras for that reason. We're still going to keep the nav, ray, nav buoy, though, because it's, you know, it's useful. Okay, Falcons. Falcons are pretty interesting. I feel like I say that about every ship. They are not so good at close range, high speed builds. And the reason I say that is because, mostly because frigates and destroyers do that better. What the Falcon does have going for it is a very unique combination of high speed with 80 plus maneuvering jets and high range because it is technically a cruiser. And that means it gets a cruiser targeting unit. What this allows it to do is you can make long-range harassment builds that are basically invincible because the enemy is just never going to catch them. All right, this is what we're going to do. Now, normally I like I would love to do two iron beams. I don't think we can afford that without without like flux regulation. So we're going to put a graviton here. Now, gravitons are going to be a lot better in the next patch because they're going to debuff enemy shields, right? Each Graviton hitting the shield is going to increase the damage it takes. You can think of it like one, like a Graviton reducing shield efficiency. Not by a lot, it's only increasing damage by 5% for the first, 8% for two, and 10% for three. And then it caps out at 10%. So 
So it's not a lot, but it's enough that I would actually start to think of Gravitons as a useful support weapon. For now, it's just a token weapon that I'm throwing on because it just has a... Yeah, it's. I mean, it's not too terrible against fighters, and the enemy has a lot of fighters, so it's not really the end of the world, but it would be nice to have the next patch by now. Okay. Long-range PD lasers in the front, regular ones in the back. That's not too complicated. Uh, enemies are usually going to be further away from the front than they are at the back. Right, so these ones have more damage, these ones have more range. Pretty straightforward. And just like the hammerhead, we're going to use breach missiles. Right, the Falcon and the Eagle, there's not a lot you can do with these small slots. You're either using salamanders because they don't run out of ammo, using breaches because they're pretty generous with the ammo, and they, they're generally useful even on cruisers, or you're going to do the Omega antimatter SRMs because those reload over time. And then the rest of the points go there. That's about it. It's not going to kill anything very quickly. Keep that in mind. It's if it did, it would be pretty overpowered, because this thing is... Cruisers can't catch up to it, but it also outranges a lot of enemies. It's a little... This would probably be banned if there was, like, PvP tournaments where you get to bring officers and player skills and S-mods and all that. Something would have to be done about the Falcon, because even if it's not the strongest build, it's it would be one of the most annoying with... You know, Ballistic Mastery, this can have 1,500 range on the hypervelocity drivers. You know, you stack up in your nav rating, you can get this up to 116 top speed, plus maneuvering jets. It's not killing anything anytime soon, but it sure as hell is going to harass you, and you're not going to be able to do anything about it. So yeah, I'm just going to copy the same build. Over here. Nope, that's a misclick. Okay, eagle. Eagle, eagle, eagle. So you... You... So the eagle. You need to make use of your medium energies. Otherwise, it's not worth bringing it. Right? If you're just using three medium ballistics, you, that's not good enough, right? You're not squeezing enough value out of this thing. The problem is that, well, medium energies already have shorter range than medium ballistics, and they're further back in the hull. So it's a very awkward weapon setup. Trying to maximize the value you get out of it is difficult, and you can't just compensate for that by slapping on a bunch of missiles because it's only got two small hard points. Now with the buffs to the Eagle and the missile autoloader coming out, it's gonna have some, I think it's actually gonna be pretty interesting. Uh, the Eagle as it exists in the current patch, not good, but I've buffed the Eagle, so you'll see that it actually is kind of workable. Now, obviously, medium energies are not known for their great anti-shield efficiency. They are pretty good against armor, right? You've got phase lances and antimatter, or heavy blasters and ion pulsers and ion beams, so EMP and anti-armor it does have, but anti-shield is a bit iffy. So instead, we're going to put our kinetics here, and in that case, you've got four options. Uh, well, actually three options, because I don't like heavy autocannons. So, here's what you've got. You've got Heavy Needler is the damage option. It's got the best DPS and the best burst damage. Hypervelocity is the long-range option. It's got the best range. But then the third part of this triangle is the efficiency option. It's the cheapest, best flux efficiency. And that's what I'm going to go with here. Triple Arbalest is... I would say, underrated. We're going to go with Double Phase Lance as our anti-armor option. Also really good against frigates. Right? If you you know, you know, pump a Lasher's shield full of Double Phase Lance, it's not going to last very long. Now, I would love to put an Ion Beam here. I don't think we're going to have enough flux for it, so instead I'm going to stick a Graviton. Again, not super useful right now, but hopefully in the next patch, this will be able to debuff the enemy shields, which will make the R R everything else better. Okay, same point defense setup. This time we're gonna do salamanders. Let's see, targeting unit. 
flux distributor to bring that closer and stabilize shields because 9 for 140. Yeah, put the rest into caps. This is a fine ship. And then lastly, the conquest. You'll notice up until now, I've been filling out almost every weapon slot. You know, the herons are a bit of an exception. I just put burst PDs in the, the slots with the best firing arcs. But for the most part, I'm filling out just about every weapon slot. The conquest is going to be the opposite, right? We're going to be ignoring as many weapon slots as possible. So what we've got here is, I love to put Mjolnirs on this thing, but only after I've got Gunnery Implants and Ballistic Mastery to get that extra range. Without those things, I'm going to go for Gauss Cannons to, for that extra range. They're going to have... And Gauss Cannons are... They're kind of like Mjolnirs, right? They're you know, good enough against shields. They also have pretty decent hit strength, so they're kind of, you know, they're good enough against armor. So they're kind of like a weird Gauss cannon, or, yeah, they're kind of like a weird Mjolnir. Anyways, they're filling the same idea of, like, being, a, being able to shoot through hull, you know, do hull damage, and do shield damage. Okay, and then lastly, Sabos. I like to put these here because sometimes the AI gets a little squirrely, and gets, it'll be circling an enemy cruiser, and then it'll, like, drive up right next to a frigate that it's decided to ignore. Having some sabos to shoot at that frigate are pretty useful, right? Two sabo pods should overload a lasher pretty easily, and that will get rid of it. That'll make it drive away so that it's not, you know, harassing you. And I did say AI there. You did not mishear me. I'm not going to be piloting this thing. I'm actually going to be putting it on autopilot. Yeah, so we'll see how this goes. That is actually how I did get that uh, super mega high score of a perfect run. This was on autopilot. Hopefully I can show you that again. So, yeah, this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be linking the missiles, because Hurricanes, I find, don't actually work on that many ships. The Conquest is one of those ships. The Conquest, the Atlas Mark II, and the 14th Legion. In the, with the current ships in the game, those are the ones I would use it on. You, you line up double Hurricane, link them together, pretty good. And with that, we're going to stack up a million and a half hull mods, heavy armor, targeting unit. We're not going to be relying on shields with this one. Let's see, ECCM for the... no, that's right, I missed missile racks. There we go. I like to stack them in order of most expensive to least expensive. Just keeps things organized. ECCM, so... Because, well, hurricanes are in the current patch are a lot better with ECCM. In the next patch, they're getting buffed, well, changed, so they're, they're going to have fewer submunitions, meaning they're losing some damage, but they're going to be more accurate. So ECCM might not be super necessary next patch, but right now, I would absolutely take it. Okay, we've gone through those. The last couple things are stabilized shields, because the shield flux is pretty high, 15 for 240. Then, resistant flux conduits, because salamanders do EMP damage. You might notice we don't have a lot of point defense. If a conquest flames out, you're in a little bit of trouble. So, getting that resistant flux conduits to cut the damage from salamanders in half, on top of, you know, any other EMP damage in half, is pretty good. Also, being able to vent actively, and then rely on a little bit of armor tanking, and then put your shield back up, it does kind of work on the on the conquest. Right, we're, we're doing a little armor tanking here, especially once you get impact mitigation and polarized armor. I think I've tried shield tanking and I've tried armor tanking. I think the armor tanking works better on the conquest. That doesn't mean you can use shield chunt. I've seen people do that. I think it's a bad idea, right? You don't want to take a hellbore even if you've got two thousand armor. Having a shield, the shield might be terrible. But having it there to block some high explosive damage makes your armor last a lot longer. So, yeah, get your hands off that shield shunt, young man. And lastly, turret gyros. Because you might notice the Gauss cannons have this thing down at the turn rate section. It says very slow. The Conquest, with its maneuvering jets, can actually turn a lot faster than the Gauss cannons can. That'll throw their, their aim way off. And getting back on target might take a while. 
So, instead of doing that and watching it miss a ton of shots and just feeling intense internal pain, I would recommend getting turret gyros. With other large weapons, it's usually not an issue, but with the tur with Gauss cannons, especially with armored weapon mounts, I would recommend turret gyros. And then the last bit, we put in 25 vents, because 240 flux plus 1200 from two Gauss cannons, that's 1440. So we've got a bit 10 extra. As long as we're not firing these things, we're good. And if we are firing these things, we have a large flux pool to absorb it. So we're going to be fine. Okay. That probably took a while. Might even be longer than the battle. We will see. Okay. Deploy everything. And so... I guess I should explain why battle size matters so much. It's because the enemy fleet being larger than yours, on maximum battle size, they can deploy their whole fleet. All at once. If you bring it down to 200, you cannot deploy all of your ships, but not, but they are capped at the same cap that you are. Like they've got the same limit. So in that situation, you're still fighting the same full-size fleet, but they're trickling in as reinforcements after you've killed stuff, which makes it a little bit easier. In that case, I would recommend hardened subsystems on a lot of your ships, because it's going to take a little bit longer, but it will be easier. So if you're trying to practice fleet-on-fleet -fleet combat, and master a lot of these skills. That's how I would recommend doing it. You know, if you're struggling, bring it down to 200, then move it up to 300, then move it up to 400. If you really want to challenge yourself, you can use the default builds too, but, you know, I think in a, in a real campaign, you're not going to do that, right? You're going to be using your own builds because they're way better. Because you watched this channel and I taught you how to make good builds. So you are going to sit in the corner so you don't die. Now, the enemy's cap closest capture point is here, so that's where they're going to go first. Which means that I'm going to click on everything else. I'm going to leave the flagship on uh, search and destroy so that it doesn't try and go compete over the capture points. We, I don't really want it to do that, I just want it to do its own thing going around killing ships. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put two defense points like this. So this is going to split the fleet. Some of them are going to go this way, some of them are going to go this way. Because we're not, we want the enemy fleet to come through. They're going to try and take our capture points that we've got. And we want to go around them, picking off stragglers around the sides, and eventually surround whatever's left of the enemy fleet. And just come at them from every direction. So we're going to let it run like that. And once we take our first capture point, we can deploy that last vigilance. Okay, do have to keep an eye on the Sunder, it is pretty fragile. And also, another thing, another reason to keep uh, different main weapons on each Heron is so you can tell which one is which at a glance. Because this one, if they've got their fighters deployed, you can't just look at it and figure out which one it's got. Now, you could read the name, or, but in, if you're actually piloting your ship in the heat of battle, you might not be inclined to do that. So instead, having a different weapon on each ship means that at a glance you can tell which one is which. Okay, so the ships are split up enough. I'm going to remove those. Deploy this guy. And I'm going to set each of these vigilants to escort a destroyer. And that should work for us. Now it looks like they've sent an enforcer down the middle and to the left. Yeah. This thing, the uh, the Falcon by itself is not going to kill this thing anytime soon. But it is going to sit there, gr drive up the flux, give it some EMP damage, which sets it up as an easy kill for somebody else. Just like that. Okay. So, it looks like they've taken this and they're moving over to the right. We're going to want to not fight over those capture points. We're going to go, we want to go around them. Okay, yeah, and here. Easy. Also, avoid this. Just make good use of the avoid order, alright? This is training you for how to handle Ordos. Just pretend that this thing is a Radiant. You're gonna put an avoid order on it, and you're gonna stay the hell out of its way. Now, these guys over here, these are what we want to go after. These stragglers, right? Because we've got all of these Moras, this... Right? Like, if it's a condor, you could take, say, 
uh, safety override eagle drive up to that condor and blast it to pieces, and that removes some of their fighter support. It's a great idea. You can't do that with a Mora. It's got a ton of armor. It's a it's just a massive brick, and then also it's got medium missiles. So let's say it's got a pair of Savo pods. It's going to sit there, damper field, absorb your damage, and then it's going to fire some Savos back at you. It's not a good... You, you generally want to avoid that. So, with that in mind, what we want to do is... These guys are going to, you know, pretend to keep them busy, but they're just going to avoid them. These guys are in a really vulnerable position. I can actually give you an, a kill order. Right, and it's even perfect. If the fighters come in, they're coming straight into the Devastators while the gas cannons are pointed at the actual enemy. <clears throat> yeah, this is looking good. You can also capture this while we're at it. Oh, and I didn't really speak about the bonuses, did I? Uh, comm relays increase command point generation. We have a lot of them anyways. Really, the important thing about comm relays is that for deployment points, they count twice as much as the other points. Nav buoys. If we have both of these, that gets us up to 20. Right now, we've only got one, so we're at 16, and then sensor jammers. Uh, we've got both of those. So, yeah, we've got an ECM of 12. 10 from the sensor jammers, 2 from this guy in the corner. Uh, I wouldn't obsess too much about the actual bonuses from the capture points. The important thing is really the fact that the enemy will fight over them. They'll send some ships, and that makes them isolated from the main fleet and easier to kill. And you can see the Vigilance is being harassed by its nemesis, a uh, swarm of fighters. Now, if it aims the thumper at one of them and actually shoots, it can actually do some pretty good damage. But it might die here. We'll, we'll also tell them to avoid that. Uh, get out of there! No, he's probably screwed. Okay, so we've already killed... Yeah, he's gone. So it's not going to be a perfect one. But, yeah, that's not really something I can do much about. It's an acceptable loss. See, we... The guys who are here cleaned up pretty easily, right? Hurricanes, high-intensity laser, and phase lenses. We'll just blow up ships pretty quickly. Right, we've got plenty of anti-shield for a low-tech enemy. Okay, so all that's left is this main brick, really. The, the core of their fleet. I actually haven't had to do too much commands in this battle. It's going fairly quickly. I mean, hey, that's good. It makes, the, uh, it makes me look more skilled. Now, hopefully we can handle the rest of this without any losses. But we'll see. Okay, you can replace the uh, other one as an escort. Yeah. Moras, as great as they are, they do have a couple weaknesses. One, slow. Oh, wow. See, this right here. This right here. That Devastator should be able to stop Cobras from coming in. But the fact is, it was facing the wrong way. It was probably pointing its Devastator at an enemy ship instead of at the fighters coming in. And now it's taken a big chunk of damage. Cobras are also really good against Moras, because Moras are slow, and they have very low flux capacity, so the Cobras by themselves, not only can they hit it, they can overload its shields by themselves. Okay, and that's gone. Okay. Probably don't want you getting all that close to the Onslaught. Maybe not the best idea. I'm a little concerned now. I probably should have been paying a bit more attention to that. Okay, you're, I told you to go that way. You're, you're not doing... Sometimes the AI is not going to do exactly what you want it to do, so... Just keep that in mind. Honestly, I'm tempted to re-record this to actually get a battle where I have to do more commanding. So far, it's actually been pretty simple. Okay, hold on. That, it's turning towards the Sunder. The Sunder is pretty fragile. We don't want that. So you can put an avoid order and then tell whatever ships you want to engage it. You can take click on them and right click on it. So everyone else will avoid it, but the Conquest will treat it like, a, like normal, basically. Yeah. That Mora was trying to escape. I could have just let it escape. 
Uh, I want to go for maximum kills because it's more fun that way. So, we'll see what we can do. There's still four carriers and an onslaught. All of their... Oh, wait. There's also this guy. Watch this. That's a high-intensity laser for you. Yeah, so here, look at that. It, it doesn't need port defense all around the ship. All right, the shield will block missiles and high explosive weapons, while if it gets harassed by fighters, it'll use the devastators on them. Now, there's actually a lot... I've played this battle a few times, and there's definitely a lot more things that I could probably... A lot more valuable lessons I could extract from this mission if I played it again, but I'm... You know, probably better off just moving on to a different mission, and you know, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure there's other things that could eventually come around. Right, instead of boring people by playing the same mission over and over. Yeah, I don't think it's boring. Triple Cobra Slam. Yeah. Against a low-tech enemy like this, the Cobras are going to look amazing. Although, to be fair, uh, even if you're up against a late-game high-tech fleet, they're still probably going to have, like, a Paragon. You know, it's going to be able to hit that. But I guess if the Paragon's at the point where you're getting to a shield, it's already dead anyways. And look at that. Overload. Clean. Yeah, because I, I, I talked a lot about some stuff, like, ordering around your carriers. I didn't actually end up needing to do any of that, because for the most part everything's just worked out. You are in a terrible position, my friend. Please get out of there. Right. That's one of the annoying things. Like, all it... Man, these Cobras are putting in so much work. Uh, all the, the Sunder needed to do... The Onslaught was overloaded. So all it needed to do was sit at maximum range and hit it with the high intensity laser. But it decided to get a little fancy. Well, in the end, it turned out alright. So yeah, what is that? One Vigilance lost? Uh, not too shabby, considering the enemy fleet is much bigger than ours. And you can look at that. Conquest didn't even take that much armor damage. Yeah, one loss. Ooh, they did get one retreat too, so I guess it's not tech, not perfect like the other mission, but... You know, that was pretty good. I There was a lot of rambling. <laughs> There's a lot to cover in this game. I don't know if that was more time spent on the actual mission, or on the loadouts, or which one is more important. But, you know. This is not a comprehensive guide. This is a sort of uh, me playing the game, and then I talk over it, and hopefully you guys can extract some value out of that. So yeah, that's about it. See ya.